Our sermon text this morning is from Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Romans 13, 8 through 14. You'll find that in your worship folder. Also in the Pew Bible, page 948. As you're able, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? Romans 13, 8 through 14. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is, is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Please be seated. Let us pray. Our Lord, uh, this week in our nation has been a week of interesting and sometimes challenging news. We do acknowledge that we all know that as we come now to your word. At the same time, inevitably, in a congregation like this, there are many personal uh, matters that are uh, at the forefront of our minds. Uh, We already was reminded of one of those, and we bring that before you too. Our Lord, we thank you that we do have the extraordinary opportunity as your people to hear from you. And so we pray, Lord, would you uh, comfort us? encourage us, give us clarity and wisdom for the challenges that we face in our own lives, spiritual power to live increasingly as you have called us to live. And so we ask, Lord, that you would feed us And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, if you would uh, turn with me in your Bibles to that passage we just had read out, Romans chapter 13, and we're looking this morning from verses 8 through to verse 14. You'll remember from last week, uh, the first half of chapter 13 was addressing the matter of governing authorities. And this week, uh, Paul indicates that he is continuing to focus on the world around, the society around the church at Rome with a verbal transition, this idea of owe, owe no one anything except to love each other. But while he's thinking of the society around the church, now he's much more at a micro, uh, individual level, level, love your neighbor, how are we to love our neighbors? Now, it's important for us as we dive back into uh, Paul's letter to the Romans to remember the overall theme and message of uh, this letter. So, if you have a Bible and you turn with me to chapter 1 and verse 16, you'll see there Paul introduces what he will be teaching us. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, he writes, verse 16, chapter 1. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is from faith to faith, by faith from first to last, 
and then he quotes uh, from Habakkuk, from the Old Testament, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, in ancient letters of this kind of public communication, it was uh, quite common to have what is known as a thesis statement towards the beginning. That is a main message or a main point. And there is Paul's main point. The gospel of God, by faith, the righteous shall live by faith. But of course, the question is, why, Paul, are you writing this letter? What is your purpose? If that is your theme, what is your purpose? So if you turn with me now in your Bibles to the end of Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 15, you'll see there that Paul explains uh, towards the end of the letter what his purpose all along has been. So chapter 15 and verse 15, he says, I have written to you quite boldly on some points. So this is why he has written, I have written to you quite boldly on some points, as if to remind you of them again because of the grace, of, uh, of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles or to the nations with a priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God. So that's the same theme, the gospel of God, and he's explaining why that has been his theme, so that the Gentiles or the nations might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So he's speaking about the gospel of God for the purpose that this gospel would go to all nations. In other words, Paul's letter to the Romans is a bold reminder of the gospel of God for the sake of all nations that they might be an offering acceptable to God, that is pleasing and honoring and glorifying to God. That's the uh, purpose that he's writing to this great church in the great city of Rome with all the resources that they have. And so, uh, at the, uh, in this uh, chapter 15, again slightly further on the chapter, verse 24, I plan uh, to uh, visit you when I go to Spain. So he hopes to visit them while he's passing and he wants them to help him in his journey on, in his missionary work on as he goes on to Spain. And so he sees this church at Rome as a strategic church in a strategic location. They need a bold reminder of the gospel of God so they might be a hub for the mission work of God throughout the world, and that is what he's trying to achieve. And so in the first uh, section of Romans, which is from Romans 1 through to 11, he explains the gospel of God. He ends up, because it's all by grace, by God's work, received through faith. Therefore, end of chapter 11, for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. It gives God glory. But of course, the question is, what does that mean in practice? And so from chapter 12 to the end of the letter, he explains what it means in practice. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, by this gospel that I've explained to you, to live a certain way to present your bodies as living sacrifices, that is to be fully committed to God in response to all that God has done for you. And that means as a community that God has given us various grace gifts. We therefore are to make the most of the gifts that God has given us to build each other up, to reach the world. If it's encouraging, let Him encourage. If it's teaching, let Him teach, etc. And then he says in the second half of chapter 12 and verse 9, well, I want you to love each other. And it's very important as a, a church that is shaped by the gospel of Jesus Christ that you're shaped in his image, that is to be a people of love. Well, what about the world around Paul? Well, the first half of chapter 13 addresses our response to the governing authorities, but now he's thinking at a more relational more micro level. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. That is to love your neighbor, uh, verse 9, as yourself. Your neighbor, whether he or she is a Christian or not, there's a responsibility to love our neighbor. So the question that Paul now is addressing is how is the Christian church and how are individual Christians within the Christian church to love those around in the world. 
What about the actual person next to me? What about my colleague at work? How am I to act at the office party? How am I to think about what I post on Facebook and in social media, Twitter, and whatever else there may be? Well, Paul says there's this principle of love. And he indicates that he's thinking again about how to love those around us by saying, Oh, no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Paul then introduces two principles for the Roman Christians about how to relate to those around them. And the first is this principle of love, and he explains what that means in verses 8 to 10. And the second principle is that of time, and Paul explains what that means in verses 11 to 14. So the question is, how do I as a Christian relate to the world around at an interpersonal, relational, micro level to my neighbor, my physical neighbor next to me, my colleague at work, the friend on Facebook? How am I to relate to them? Paul says, well, there are two principles to consider. First is love, and the second is time. Well, first then, love, and this he explains in verses 8 to 10, and time he'll explain in verses 11 to 14. First, love. Verse 8 confirms that we are to owe no one anything. Of course, it is a good principle not to be in debt, but here, primarily, Paul is not thinking about financial matters. He is thinking about love and how to love those around. Owe no one anything except the continuing debt to love one another. Well, what does it mean for there to be a continuing debt to love each other? It's a difficult question, and various scholars have different answers to that question. Uh, To my mind, uh, Paul explains what he means in the second half of verse 8. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. So the debt is the debt to continue to fulfill, to fill up the law. So because, as Paul has taught, none of us can perfectly keep the law, The law of God is like a vessel that is to be completely fulfilled with love. And so, if you like, there is an ongoing debt to love the other around us. There's a constant need to grow in love, to fill up, to fulfill, therefore, the requirements of the law by loving those around us. Paul expresses that uh, responsibility in an interesting way. He says, uh, we are to love the, wo- the one who loves another. And the reason why he puts it like that is he wants us to guard against thinking of love purely in general terms. It's very easy, isn't it, to say that we love everyone, and it's much harder to love someone in particular. And so, Paul says, what really counts is we love another, someone right next to us, someone at work, someone on Facebook, love another. So this law of love to the other, to one another, then verse 9, fulfills also what is often called the second table of the Ten Commandments. That is the second half of the Ten Commandments. Now the first half of the Ten Commandments are all focused on love for God. Paul now quotes from the second table, the second half of the Ten Commandments, that are all about loving our neighbor. Of course, the first half of the Ten Commandments in many ways have been expressed and explained in the first 11 chapters of Romans. This is how our responsibility to God, our love for God, can be fulfilled and maintained as the gospel of God comes to us. Our relationship with God is now secure, and now then, how are we to treat each other? Well, focus on loving our neighbor. For, Paul explains in verse 9, the commandments, that is, 
the second table, the second half of the Ten Commandments, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And then he says, and any other commandment, for uh, he leaves out uh, the uh, commandment not to bear false witness for some reason, uh, but he makes sure we know that he includes it by saying any other commandment on this level of relating to each other are summed up or summarized in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, once again, isn't it interesting? Paul is surely thinking of Jesus' teaching here. Now, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus was asked. Now, well, he replied, didn't he? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. First half of the Ten Commandments summarized. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. You see, as Paul has reflected on Jesus' teaching about taking up our cross and following Him, we're to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. And then as he has reflected on Jesus' teaching about loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us, and as he has reflected on Jesus' teaching about giving to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's, so now he reflects on Jesus' teaching about how the law of God is all summarized, well, first in love for God, but now second in love for neighbor. So the second table of the Ten Commandments, which are focused upon our mutual responsibilities to each other, are all summarized or summed up in this word, verse 9, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, will you note that when we are asked to love our neighbor as ourselves, the command is not to love ourselves. The command assumes that we love ourselves. The command is to love our neighbor, pay attention to our neighbor, think about what is best for our neighbor. In the same way that uh, we naturally pay attention to, think about, want what is best for ourselves. Well, finally then, in this section on the responsibility we have to love our neighbors, in verse 10, Paul says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Uh, one ancient commentator put it like this, if you love somebody, you will not uh, kill him, nor will you commit adultery, steal from him, or bear false witness against him. It's the same with all the other commands of the law. Love ensures that they are kept. Now, again, remember, Paul's thinking about the micro-relational level of loving our neighbor here. Well, love ensures that we do no wrong to the person living next to us, our colleague, the person we interact with in social media. So in a sense then, summarizing this first section of our passage this morning, our responsibilities towards our neighbor, our colleague, the person in front of us and next to us, whether Christian or not. is a simple uh, set of responsibilities, if a rather challenging set of responsibilities. It is the law of love. The Christian is to be the person who is guided by the golden rule, to do to others as we would have them do to us. We are to be those who treat those around us with the radical, costly, Christ-like debt of love. So, fulfilling and summarizing the law of God, and therefore doing no wrong to our neighbor. Now, of course, this is, uh, in a certain way, simple, but also rather difficult. 
And we will need significant help in order to be able to do it in any effective or successful way at all. And so now in the next section from verses 11 to 14, Paul puts this responsibility towards our neighbors in a specific gospel framework. And in particular, in relation to the salvation history or time or hour in which we live. And the power of Christ which we have access to as Christians in order to live like Christ in this time between Christ's first coming and His second coming. So you will remember the question is, how do we act towards those around us in the world at a relational, micro, neighbor level? And the first answer is that our prevailing rule is to be the rule of love. But the second answer to that provides us not just with the rule, the rule of love, but also a perspective and a power that comes from knowing the time. And this time aspect of Paul's teaching is uh, from verse 11 to verse 14. So, uh, besides this, he writes, verse 11. That is, besides the rule of love, there is another aspect which I want to tell you about in terms of how to relate to those around you. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Now, this time is not time as in whether it is 2.30 in the afternoon or 3.30 in the afternoon, but time as in the stage of salvation history in which we live. We live in the time or the hour when Christ has come, but before He has come back or returned. And so, in this sense, salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. See, that word salvation can be used in the Bible to mean when you become a Christian. That is your salvation, when you become a Christian. And in this sense, if you are a Christian here this morning, you are already saved. But in the Bible, the word salvation is also sometimes used as it is here in the sense of that final day when Christ returns and we will live with Him in glory. In that sense, our salvation is closer now than it was. And so, because of this perspective, uh, we are, uh, Paul says, to wake from sleep. Uh, The picture is uh, that Jesus' first coming was like an alarm clock going off in the morning. Well, now it is daytime and there is work to be doing. And one day Christ will return. So now, in this time, we must wake up and get on with what it is that Christ has called us to do. And so Paul carries on with this time perspective in verse 12. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. What a wonderful image is that armor of light. But what does he mean by it? Well, because Paul was now applying all he has been teaching about the gospel of God in the first 11 chapters of Romans, he can now use these evocative images like this one, armor of light, because they're intended to remind us of all that gospel of God that Paul has taught us. So, to put on the armor of light means 
to believe in Jesus Christ. It means to arm ourselves with the truth of God. It means to recognize that we are all sinners and there is none righteous, and therefore receive Christ's righteousness through faith. It is, as Paul has said, to mortify or put to death the deeds of the flesh. It is to take courage because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so defeat the devil's lies that we are condemned for our sins if we are in Christ. No, not at all. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so we come out of the shadows. We're justified by faith alone. It is His righteousness, and now we are to be armed with this armor of light. That is the gospel of God. And this is the extraordinary, wonderful, joy-filled state of the Christian. And so then, how can we Christians love those around us? Paul says, by putting on the armor of light, by remembering who we are in Christ, by refusing to go back to living in the old way. He says, uh, cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. In other words, says Paul, uh, you are a Christian. Well, it is time to behave like it. Don't go back to the darkness. The day has dawned. Live in the light. Put on the armor of light. Get rid of the deeds of darkness. Be who you are now in Christ. And so then, verse 13 let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual morality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. So the day has come, we are awake, we are to put on the arm of light, and now our walk, that is the lifestyle of our lives, our tendencies, our habits, our characteristics, our walk is to be as in the daytime. You see, it's just a human thing, isn't it, that very few wild parties begin at 6.30 in the morning. There is a natural human tendency whereby deeds that people feel ashamed about tend to be done at night. While well, similarly, says Paul, live like you are going about in the daytime. Live as if everyone can see you. Live as if constantly in the public eye. Live as if the most godly person you know were watching your every move. As if your office had glass walls, as if your words could all be heard by everyone, as if your emails were published the next morning for everyone in the world to read. Live in the light. Now that is the standard, and of course it's a very hard standard to achieve. But this perspective, the time in which we live helps. We put on the armor of light, that is, the power of the gospel to live this way. Which then means, uh, verse 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. You see, says Paul, it all starts in the mind. Make no provision for the flesh or give no forethought to how to sin. 
or entertain sinful thoughts or ideas. Instead, when there is a sinful thought that comes to your mind or you're beginning to give some provision for it or forethought to it, instead of that, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So you bring to mind all that Paul has taught about the gospel, all the truth about Jesus, and you put on Jesus. You place Jesus, as it were, in front of you and over you. And you put on His characteristics and tendencies. So instead of trying on some sinful thought or behavior for size to see how it fits, you are now putting on Jesus. Now, that sort of way of approaching life, wearing Jesus' way of being, may feel a little unnatural at first, but for the Christian, it is truly who we are and can increasingly become. It is an active putting on. You, as it were, put the armor of Jesus' personality in front of you and do what He would do in that situation. Instead of doing what your old sinful self, that provision or forethought for the flesh, would uh, really want to do. It is so hard. And we need grace and forgiveness for each failure. And yet, we have a rule of how to act towards those around us. That is the rule of love. And we have a power to enable us to act like that towards those around us. That is the power of the person of Jesus. Because we are in Christ and our salvation is nearer now than it was, we can put on Christ and give no provision for acting in sinful ways, but increasingly instead love those around us in purity, in truth, as in the light wearing, as it were, the clothes of Jesus Himself as we walk in the light. Let us pray together. Our Lord, we uh, thank You that You have given us a uh, principle by which to live, and we think now of the various opportunities we would have as individuals to love our neighbors. We pray, Lord, that that rule of love would be our standard. Would you help us to have that rule uh, guide us as we think what to post in social media? What to say to our neighbor? What to do? To love our neighbor as ourselves. Would you help us to actually think about what our neighbor needs? And so that those around us are not merely tools for us to get what we need, but people made in the image of God for whom uh, God, uh, whom God loves, who you love, Lord. And would you help us then to be an expression of that love? Lord, we need your help for that. And so we also uh, pray, Lord, that... Uh, we would, in 
Uh, your power now that uh, we have because of your Holy Spirit, that we are now yours if we are a real Christian, put on actively the Lord Jesus Christ, his way of acting, his way of thinking, his way of being. And so increasingly, Lord, would it be the case that uh, we are more and more like Jesus? And uh, we bow before you and pray these things in his precious name. Amen.